TLO, what's poppin'? <laughs> we are on Twitch. We are live. By the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK. Right behind me, you see it, a little warning screen. Just in case. Don't forget, twitch.com is where you can catch the live streams. Usernames at the bottom of the screen. And we got Patreon, where we post Monday through Sunday. Premier League highlights, UK movies, and UK series, like TV shows and things of that nature. It's, it's I mean, hey, if you've never been a Patreon and you want stuff to watch... I'm talking about there's countless hours. There got to be like 800 hour hours worth of stuff on there. I don't know. Maybe more. No, nah, probably more. I ain't even going to hold it. Uh, this is Jimmy the Giant. I'm trying to get through all of his old stuff that I, I peeped that I liked. Uh, I don't think this is that old. But this is the decline of Brit Britain's failed Hitler. That, that title hit different. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. I gotta move sides. Jimmy B on To understand side. how Mr. Mosley nearly led Britain into playing with the ideas of fascism, we, we need to get an idea of the era in which this all happened. The 1900s was shaped by the Industrial Revolution. Europe and Britain were now very wealthy. And so the standard of lives improved, not only for the rich elite, but also the lowly plebs were even starting to see that their children were dying less. There was now a developing middle class. People could eat sugar, more sugar. This sounds very good, but and there is a bar. It wasn't so smooth. You know, in order to make an omelette, you have to break some eggs. And by breaking eggs, it meant destroying the lives of farmers. There was a thing called the Corn Laws that had been repealed. So the Corn Laws basically made it so British farmers had an advantage over foreign import. Them boys were pissed because, you know, now they were all jobless and starving to death. They're now seeing the country is getting wealthier, the aristocrats are getting wealthier. All this new money's coming in, but none of it's being funneled to sort of help these farmers that had just been put out of work. They were just left in ruin, forced to upend their entire lives that they had known living on farms and move towards big cities to get jobs. This is very important for us to understand the mood of an entire nation and its feelings towards an establishment that they perceived to let them down. So now we had the big cities, you know, the fucking mecca of business and trade, the place you want to be. And they were shit. They were really not good. <laughs> Overcrowded. Hey, hey, Jimmy is funny. I don't care what nobody got to say about bro. I was really like intrigued with what he was saying and then here he go talk about the city shit. That's tough. Big busy London that's loud. This dude high? And they were shit. They were really not good. Overcrowded. Is he high or sleep? The one above my head. Crowded, busy London that's loud, disgusting living standards, surrounded by piss and poo. And on top of that, you know, just it's say like that you've finished your 16 hour day at work whilst you're dying of cholera. Your mate Billy just had his arm chopped off in a machine. And then as you toddled on home to your shitty slum, you might walk past a place like Kensington. And you'd look around and you go, hang on a fucking second. What's going on here? What's that, a toilet? Running water. And so these people were living in very close proximity to very, very wealthy aristocrats sound like west london that's what y'all say like the west side the west london the hood is on one side of the street and then the wealthy is on the other side of the street and then you wonder why robberies are committed tough and so you know there might be a little part inside of you that might start romanticizing the days where you're out working the field dawn till dusk smelling the fresh air yeah you might have starved to death and lost five children in infancy but at least you're far away from these posh pricks so just take all that in and just imagine you know all this animosity started to give the boys a couple of ideas and in this time there was this new sexy seductive idea floating around called communism it saw revolutions in places like france the german confederate 
Federation, the Austrian Empire and Sardinia. The revolution sought to improve living conditions, settle nationalist questions and fix government deficiencies. Alright, cool. So we got that out of the way. Now we can focus on your boy Mosley. Okay. I, I would guess he just took the, those ideas, communism, and just hyper, hyper pushed them, hyper inflated with the morals and background and, and all of that stuff, right? You both met bad men before. This is one of the top series that I've ever watched. I'm American and, and, and American, I'm talking about anything. <laughs> Peaky Blinders was it. I'm about to meet is the devil. Born on the 6th of October 1894, it might come as a complete shocker to you, but Sir Oswald Arnold Mosley, 6th Baronet, was a wealthy man. He grew up in Mayfair. That's the expensive place in Monopoly that you convince your little brother to sell to you for the electric company and waterworks. It's a good deal, Billy. Look, you get two. You get two here. I get one. <laughs> you get two. The Mosley name was prestigious in this time. His father was, I'm gonna have to read it, the third cousin to the 14th Earl of Stratford and Strathmore and Kingthorne, father of Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. So, you know, he sort of kind of knew the royals, I guess. Anyway, Oswald Mosley started his life very privileged, you know, Dick swanging his way into the upper echelons of British society. And he wasn't a layabout, he was pretty techy with fencing, he'd become like a champion, he was he was good at boxing. What I'm trying to say is, Oswald Mosley was a- No, real question, real question, time out. I've seen fencing just now. Do people really fence in the UK? Like. Like when you go to school, is there an option for fencing? Like, okay, you got football, you know what I'm saying? You got cricket, you got tennis, you got rugby, and then there's just fencing. That's a thing? The Giga Chat, six foot four. Charismatic, handsome, athletic, and most importantly, wealthy. Oswald had the world in his hands, but then the world went to war. So he swooped in at the perfect time. England declares war. After war and famine. On Germany, the first world war has begun. Without this becoming a World War I history video, I'll give you the long and the short of it. In 1914, the whole world went to war over some largely stupid shit. Now, Mosley was actually already in the army before the war. He was sent to Sandhurst. He managed to get expelled in June because he, like, beat up someone over a game of polo, which sounds incredibly aristocratic. And he had a bit of a reputation for fighting and kind of being a bit of a dick. But one month later, he was called back because, as I say, the world went to war. Mosley was a legit war boy. You know, dodging bullets and bombs. He fought in the Western Front in France. And this might surprise you, but it probably wasn't a, a lot of fun. It probably sucked a little bit. This would have been a very interesting thing because he was an aristocrat. This would have probably been his first real exposure to working class people, at least on a personal friendship level. And probably through speaking to them and understanding them, he started to develop a sympathy for the working class. But you see, Oswald's war career was cut short because one day it was bring your mum to work day the boy hopped in a plane he was doing some fucking spins and shit crashed the bugger and broke his leg severely this gave mosley a cool and survived sexy war limp. His leg was still fucked, but they just chucked him back into the front line of war. And at the Battle of Luz, he passed out because of just pain. It was probably around here where the generals looked. Back, back in them days, World War One, World War Two. listen, hey, if you can stand up, you can fight. You can shoot this gun, buddy. To him and went, yeah, maybe you shouldn't be in war. And this is where his life would take a completely different turn. Mosley was sent to work desk jobs in the Ministry of Munitions and the Foreign Office. It would be here where he would start to rub shoulders with the political elite. This would lead him to marrying Lady Cynthia, who was daughter to Lord Curzon, who had been an MP, a Secretary of State, and a Lord. So basically, Mosley married up, and this was a major deal. When they got married, the King and Queen attended their wedding. And so he started befriending some very powerful people, and it would be really... He I'm not gonna lie, this Mosley fella had a plan. None of this was by accident. He was very calculated in his moves. Bro was playing chess his entire life after the war. He was, all right, I broke my leg. Listen, I got to do something different. Continue. Here where he would start politicking. Before we go any further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to... 
today's sponsor. Wow. Jimmy the Giant, congratulations on your sponsorship with Squarespace. I hope one day that I can get any of these sponsorships. Gotta pay the bills. I feel like when I give that spiel, it makes it, it, it like softens it when I fast forward through. <laughs> From my research, I've kind of concluded there's there's a few different ways that you can look at Mosley's political career. It's probably interesting to take note of this and as I tell you more of the story to sort of evaluate it through this lens. You can either see him as like a power hungry, crazy dictator or Dicky T, I think the kids call it, who was always like that and was a terrible person from the start. Or you can take the empathetic approach and look at him as someone who had deeply held convictions and beliefs and a vision for Britain. Are you going to talk about unemployment today? I feel like <clears throat> to the outsider looking in, I feel like I always have that like that like conviction like that oh he's just this second one but then it eventually it turns into dictatorship in my mind I it's like these people like you got to have to be there Hey okay. What I'm just you know not like Hitler Hitler it was it was terrible I didn't have to be there for that we knew hey, Of course it is I know nothing about this guy so it's like for the first time hearing is what I mean. It's the one problem that really matters today. Or maybe he was both. See, there it is, both. On the 14th of December 1918, Mosley became one of the youngest MPs in British history. And before his political ideology had really formed, he just started out as like a standard conservative. However, he did actually have, from the early days, a few disagreements with the Conservative Party. He had this crazy idea that the British state should have some responsibility in looking after the British public. I think you can see this as an early sign in his political career that he had some sympathy for the working class, probably from war. He also disapproved of- That doesn't sound bad. <laughs> I have I would agree with that aliens not like plus probably from war he also disapproved of aliens not like UFOs and stuff but Germans <laughs> This shows an early skepticism of globalism and outsiders, which is a theme that would remain. Because he thought that they were reducing wages, underselling goods, ruining English social life, and also spreading disease. But it was one other issue, which was the most important disagreement he had with the Conservatives, and that was Ireland. We oh, solemnly Ireland. declare foreign government in Ireland to be an invasion of our national right, which we will never tolerate and we demand the evacuation of our country by the English garrison. Basically, British troops were in Ireland and we were just being horrible. <laughs> That's kind of an understatement. We were killing people who were innocent. This disagreement Mosley had with the Conservatives would show an early like seeds of his disillusionment with establishment politics. You can evaluate his approach to Ireland in two different ways, really. You can either see it that he had some genuine concern for the Irish people. In his book called My Life, he said that it evoked intense moral feeling. However, you can also hear in his own words a more nationalistic attitude where he kind of saw the treatment of the Irish as bringing disgrace to the British name. He says, again in his book, no empire no government has long sustained except by power of moral force and again it might be a bit of both it might be that he did feel some compassion but also he wanted to keep the british empire looking good and moral but this is a really important moment you have either way he wanted the brits to stop doing what they were doing in ireland right have to bear in mind he was a good old Not tory like boy that. like he was poised and many people would said he was going to be a future prime minister if he just followed the party rule he probably could have rose the ranks but when he brought his criticisms to the conservative party they completely turned on him he was branded as a renegade kicked out the party so you can say that his convictions and his beliefs led him to basically losing what was a very good career position or you could say maybe mosley was being a bit of an opportunist you have to bear in mind this is the early night in hundreds like the russian revolution has just happened that thick fucking stench of 
oh, revolution was in the air. And perhaps Mosley was actually seeing a bit further down the line that there was a growing working class rebellious movement. He could brand himself as being, you know, sympathetic to the downtrodden with such conviction that he was willing to leave his position for it. And that is exactly what happened. I want to tell you good folk first that with the dawn of a new decade, I will be setting a new course. Setting up a new- Oh, this was him in this uh, show? This is still Peaky Blinders, right? Okay. New political movement here in the very heart of England. In his book, he says, I crossed the floor in October 1920 for practical reason. Though there was also a symbolic significance, it became impossible to get a hearing on my own side. So I preferred to face my enemies rather than be surrounded by them. In 1922 to 1924, Mosley became an independent. He claims to have really been shocked that the conservatives who were supposed to be on his side didn't even listen to his perspective. Independent, that sounds like he just want to smoke with everybody. He didn't want to go to the other side, but he also wasn't being felt by his own. So he's like, listen, I'm a renegade at this point. And I think this really is where he started to feel a bemusement towards the establishment. But then, for some reason, he had some faith in the Labour Party. The Labour Party took him in as one of the comrades. Come on in, Mose. Mose before hoes. And so he went on a tour of the poor and went to Glasgow, Liverpool, Birmingham, and basically looked at how shit these people's lives were. The disease, the terrible housing conditions the piss and the poo, and also the, the war generation who were promised to come back to a good life. Living in these slums, they had been betrayed. And so he became like a socialist Labour MP. And maybe he wasn't full blown on board with everything, but he definitely liked the revolutionary attitude these people had. And in this time, in like the mid 1920s, he was actually mocking fascists. There's a quote where he says they were black shirt buffoons making a cheap imitation of ice cream sellers. To the communists and the Labour lot, that was a banger. When he said that, the boys loved it. And they elected him to Labour's NEC. But then, there would be a defining moment that would change Mosley's life forever. You've got to remember that the East End of London was a great... I feel like war and famine was his moments. Like, that's when he did his best work, this Mosley guy. It's the second time. World War I first, now the Great Depression. He just slips through the cracks right when it's... Right when the guards of the people are down. Right working class area. And when the people aren't thinking they're, they're at their straightest. Therefore, these were the people who were suffering most under the depression. So they point about they were looking for alternatives. They were desperate. Been betrayed. They'd been let down by the Labour Party. In 1929, the world went into the deepest and darkest economic recession it has ever seen. It was bad. Everyone was struggling. I mean, obviously not the aristocrats. They were fine. Don't worry about it. Mosley was now one of the Labour boys. You know, he was socialising with the socialists. He'd become very close with the Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, and he expected he was going to get a seat in the cabinet. But in 1929, Labour wins the election. Mosley doesn't get a seat in the cabinet. MacDonald didn't care. He just gave him the position of Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. And he put Mosley in charge of dealing with the unemployment issue. Mosley came up with all these radical ideas and MacDonald and everyone else shot them down. Put yourself in the position of Mosley. They just gave you a position like a Muppet to keep you quiet. Make you think you had something, but you didn't. See, they was just adding fuel to this man's fire this whole time. Face is red with rage. Now the boy's more pissed than ever, more disillusioned. In his fit of rage, he went over an hour ranting in a resignation speech in the House of Commons. No notes, just fucking trauma dumping. And what was weird is that the press and the general public were listening to him and agreeing with him. What's more is they were impressed with his ability to deliver this speech so passionately without notes and the fact that he had such a principled stance he was ready to leave his parties when he disagreed with them as opposed to just towing the party line and bettering himself. And so, in 1931, Mosley dropped the Mosley Manifesto. And it was a hit. It got support from people like John Maynard Keynes, Harold Macmillan, and he decided, fuck it, I'm going to grab some boys and I'm going to make my own party, whether you like. Mosley Manifesto. Are we going to see some key points in there? Like okay, you know what? He grabbed five Labour MPs and one Conservative MP. This new party was called 
New Pie. And, mate, the fuck it, they liked it. The people were liking this. The press was supporting it. This was like Mosley's moment. The elections were coming. It was all looking very good. He was getting lots of support. And then life turned to Mosley and played a just say no card. The boy got pneumonia, spent six weeks in hospital in the like most important times of the campaign. The press got kind of bored of him and just moved on. But Mosley wasn't going to give up so soon. And now he had a chip on his shoulder. More fuel, more fuel to the fire. More origin storylines. Chip the size of a small car. Well, friend, it's very good of you to turn up in such large numbers on a cold afternoon. And so he started to do these rallies, these these big speeches in front of people and really this is kind of where the, the trouble would start so you gotta remember now that the new party had formed and it split off from labor a lot of the labor supporters the communists the socialists all these bros they were seeing mosley as a defector and they were seeing him as trying to split the vote away from labor in our two-party system that de facto gives the win to the other party it's a slightly flawed system so at these rallies there would be these fights wait explain that again do it again socialists all these bros they were seeing mosley as a defector and they were seeing him as trying to split the vote away from labor in our two-party system that de facto gives the win to the other party it's a slightly flawed <laughs> so if you split the vote between one and two the third option wins what is okay system so at these rallies they were that seemed like a finesse would be these fights that would break out from the kind of more radical socialist communists who would go to these rallies and cause a bit of bother. By that, I mean just endless heckling and fighting with the Mosley boys. And so Mosley got a little bit scared and he hired some bodyguards. He got a boxer by the name of Kid Lewis. And it's just very important to note that Kid Lewis was Jewish. So we can probably assume that in the late 1920s, Mosley had yet to slip into anti-Semitism. That or he just didn't know he was Jewish. Anyway, the next election comes, the new party put some candidates forward. In 1931, they don't win a single seat. With his tail between his legs, Mosley went abroad and embarked upon the fascism holiday. My friends, it's an immense responsibility. You're living in a historic hour. More fuel to his fire. Ego scarred. Do remember that always. Live in that sense, I beg of you, of history and of destiny. When After packing his sun cream, Mosley headed over to Italy and met with none other than Mussolini. This was the moment where he really kind of joined the dark side. Mosley in 1931 just fucking he killed off the uh, the new party and made a new new party called the British Union of Fascists, and that would start in 1932. But la 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 la, it's, it's very important that we understand that in this time, the early 1930s, the ideas of communism and fascism, you, you can't look at them how we look at them now, because we saw them play out, we saw what happened. Spoiler alert, it wasn't good. But in this time, these are these new sexy ideas that all the cool kids are having. And in this climate of like the Great Depression, the poor are getting poorer. These movements were specifically geared towards the working class and to try and fix society. In that regard, these two ideologies do have a fair bit in common, but they have two very different ways of functioning and they play out in different ways in different countries. But communism was focused on basically reducing class difference. There was no difference in your status in society. The decision making in society around around industry and government would be collective. They had this kind of approach of globalism. They wanted to spread the revolution throughout the world and to create a shared identity for all these communist nations. The idea was that we're all the same. We're all in it together. We're all the proletariat. The ideas of fascism, especially Mosley's form of it, was to create a state-controlled society that does have a hierarchy, as opposed to the communists, that focuses on self-sufficiency. So one nation can look after itself. And they do so by protectionist policies, high tariffs on imports. And this would be a corporatist state. So it still allowed for private property and hierarchy. However, there'd be like a system of decision-making that was done through collective voting, where employees and work unions would have a say, but they were underneath the employers who were all underneath the state but they all had like a percentage of say in i wonder how poland's because poland is running so smooth and efficiently i'm just curious how everything works there i'm wondering 
the decision. So they didn't want to remove class differences, but they they thought that you could make a shared identity through nationalism. But the thing with this very nationalistic identity is it, you know, it kind of, it can devolve a bit and often there will be like this fear of the outsider very often jewish people or so it can be communists and they become like the enemy the, the shared enemy and that further bolsters our identity and then finally there's often rhetoric around like strong state leadership and also like this idea of restoring a nation to its former glory and that's why there's often this desire to rebuild old empires Reminds me of a slogan that one of the current presidents or presidential candidates go by. Italy was saved by a new movement, by a modern movement of youth, of vigor, of determination. When Mosley came back from Europe, it was like he it was like when your school friend had come back from summer holiday and was, was now an emo. Yes. Lift up your voices in this great meeting in the heart of England. Send to all the world a message. England lives and marches on. Mosley had completely reskinned. You know, he was he was like a knockoff Hitler and Mussolini. He, he wore the military uniforms. He had his own gang of black shirts surrounding him. He even had his own cool moustache. If you look at the rallies and the way he would speak, his speaking pattern. It's a terrible moustache. You know, there was there was someone it kind of seemed similar to. And I did study all those, those kind of, that kind of person, and it's very essential to do it. That doesn't mean you identify yourself with them. It merely means that you learn from great performers how to do certain things. And it was working. He really did capture Britain's attention for a period of time. You know, infamously, the Daily Mail published an op-ed called Hurrah for the Black Shirts, in which they go on to praise this movement. And he had respected politicians, economists, and lords supporting him. This was a real period of time when there was such a distrust in mainstream established politics who had been seen as not solving the problems of the working class. And so it bred an environment where those people were very susceptible to crazy new ideas. It was just a feeling of like, Fuck it, what have we got to lose? Lady Cynthia, who was Mosley's first wife, she died. He married a rather notorious lady called Diana Mitford. She died. He married a rather notorious... Look at this. That's crazy lady called Diana Mitford. She happened to just be a big fan and supporter of Hitler. Mosley pretty much met her by just like spaffing out fascist talking points to her, which I'm pretty sure. Mosley pretty much met. This is Mosley right here. Is he off a of perk? He took a perk 30? Before there was perks, they, we called it a perk Mosley. This dude is wired or something. Close your eyes. Met her by just like spaffing out fascist talking points to her, which I'm pretty sure is like how Twitter incels think that you meet women. But when they got married, they wanted to keep it a secret. And so they got married with the help of Frau Goebbels. If that surname sounds familiar, it might be because you're thinking of Joseph Goebbels. It was his wife. That was his wife. Joseph Goebbels. And when they got married, there was uh, another shady bro, you could say, who was there. His name was Adolf Hitler. And Adolf, he uh, he had a present to give Mosley on his wedding, and that was a signed photo of himself. I don't know how you would respond to receiving that. I, I suppose you would say thanks. I was kind of hoping for a, a blender, but this this is nice. And it seemed to me, rightly or wrongly, that's a question we could debate. A signed autograph photo of yourself. That certain Jews were trying to provoke a second world war. Mosley would embark on these now very sinister looking rallies. Complete with, you know, fucking Nazi salutes. It just, it, all of it just seems very like an Audi's own brand version. His origin story is crazy. This is Mosley fella. He just had a lot of fuel added to his fire. He kept getting knocked down. He kept getting turned away and he just... 
of fascism. But as I say, it was popular until 1934, where a big incident would occur that would send the British Union of Fascists down a different path. The Olympia Rally. So this was meant to be the BUF's biggest rally. It was in front of 10,000 people. And within those 10,000 people, there were planted 500 anti-fascists who disrupted the meeting. They were provoking a reaction and the black shirts beat these anti-fascists to a pulp. The audience loved it. Why does society not so keen? It's really interesting to note that the original first few years of the British Union of Fascists, they weren't anti-Semitic, at least openly or in their rhetoric and policies. But this seems to be the turning point. You know, he considered that most of these people were Jewish and now he started to do the I hate the Jews spill. People don't understand now in those great mass meetings, uh, which some people were trying to break up, and the speaker had to hold his own. And if you saw that they'd come from another country to break up an English meeting, you gave them a rough answer. However, and as stupid as it feels like to have to explain the differences, his anti-Semitism was different to Hitler's. That obviously doesn't make it better, but it is important to note. Hitler had all the... Oh, okay. I, I was wondering if he was going to explain the differences, but it looks like you are. His views on like, you know, racial superior, you know, like better blood, better genetic, this kind of thing. Mosley didn't. His came from more of a fear of the outside, fear of influence from different nations. And this sort of attitude of, you know, we don't hate them. We just really love us. It's This came out five months ago. I feel like that's the general senses of a lot of these, like, a lot of the rallies that's going around in oh, England, not rally, see, now, a lot of the peaceful protests that are going around, one side is saying, we don't hate them, we just really love ourselves. I don't know, it's actions speak louder than words, huh? You can say something until you blue in the face, but if you act in the, uh, like like a certain way, then hey, I'm gonna trust the actions. It's de facto the same shit, but it's easier to sell that talking point than trying to talk about bloodline purity. Mosley didn't want to like exterminate anyone. He just wanted to get them far away from us, you know, and it'd be this whole like make Britain for the British kind of vibe. If you think about how at the beginning he was sort of anti-Germans, you can see a consistency now, right? in this sort of attitude of protectionist, self-sufficient economy, very pro-nationalistic and very skeptical to foreign influence. So I think it was an element of he did have those views, but now the scapegoat across Europe was now the Jewish people. So he kind of jumped on that now as a popular cause that would lead to the same ends. <laughs> pride in, in your country and and not one outside influence, you know, like Poland, you know, and run self-sufficiently. I, I feel that, you know, and if you do come, you come the proper way, but it'd be those, that small percentage of people that be, that be doing the most and don't know how to shut up and chill for a second. Like, golly, you making everybody look bad. Don't overlook in the lives of great nations comes the moment of decision, comes the moment of destiny. In the early 1930s, it was looking for a split moment. Britain might have turned to fascism, or was it? Following the Olympia incident, the mood around Mosley completely changed. The newspapers and the MPs that last week was, were shouting hurrah for the black shirts were now like, fascism, no, fascism, more like, Nafism. BBC banned Mosley and the British Union of Fascists Damn. from their airwaves. So now they're forced to start streaming on Kick and Rumble. As well, just in the sort of... It's like, well, that's how they did Tommy Robinson, ain't it? And everybody else who spoke any type of crazy way. General public. By the... Labeled crazy way. Mid to late 1930s, the... Attitudes towards fashion and just from their airwaves. The so now they're yeah, forced nah. to start streaming on kick and rumble. As well, just in the sort of general public, by the mid to late 1930s, the attitudes towards fashion had started to change. 1934, Hitler rose to power through a military coup. The once sexy and fun idea of fascism was... Dang, Hitler wasn't even a year... I mean, a hundred years ago? Hitler was at the top of his game and... and for lack of a better term, the top of his game 90 years ago? 
That's still fresh. That's Starting tough. to not look so chill. So the BUF had a decision to make, you know, do they adjust the tone? You know, water it down a little bit. Maybe we can start serving shakshuka in the canteen. Or they could just go full extremist and just try and guess which one they picked. Full extremist? Wait, I got y'all, don't worry. I'm one of the best readers on the platform. After two years of marching into largely Jewish areas of the East End of London, the Battle of Cable Street broke out. 1936, the BUF marched for a predominantly Jewish neighborhood in London, and that went just sort of about as well as you might expect. This was called the Battle of Cable Street. He continued to organize these marches and rallies. Legislation was passed to prevent similar demonstrations from occurring, but Mosley remained unapologetic etc leading to the public order act of 1936 where the british government banned political uniforms and quasi military styled organizations his rallies really would become these spectacles of unrest in 1937 in liverpool mosley was knocked unconscious by two stones that were thrown after ynwa i knew it was gonna take liverpool to knock some sense into this man that he delivered a you know a Nazi salute on top of a van in front of 8,000 people. But you see, whilst all of this was happening, there was something else bubbling up underneath the surface. Britain was seeing Hitler go mental and they were getting a little bit anxious. Whispers and rumors of a potential war was starting to emerge. Mosley took a position of being anti-war. He didn't want the war to happen. You know, he was trying to tell people, guys, Hitler, he's not that bad. He was actually really funny at my wedding. And I joke, but this, to be honest, does seem a consistent view that Mosley has had since the beginning. He seemed to always have been anti-war. But to many others, it seemed as though he wanted Hitler to win, take over Europe, and put Mosley in charge. This is a claim that Mosley denies, and he says if the Germans came to Britain, he would fight. But regardless of the shoulda, woulda, couldas, just the optics alone of siding with Hitler yeah, they weren't great. It really just wasn't good branding. And this really was like the final nail of Oswald Mosley's career. The 1937 elections happened and the BUF won absolutely no seats. From World War One, the Great Depression, all the way into World War Two, Oswald Mosley. The responsibility lies on the shoulders of one man. By his latest act of naked aggression, Hitler has committed a crime not only against Poland, but against the whole human race. Britain went to war in 1939, and spoiler alert, we won. In this time, Mosley, his wife, and many BUF members were put in prison because they were kind of seen as traitors. People were scared that they posed a risk of, you know, being spies or trying to make some kind of problem here in Britain during a war. He was never formally charged with a crime. He was interned under defense regulation. But basically, after they all got arrested, this killed the BUF. However, after all of this, after World War II, after two years of marching into Lar- oh. Seeing what happened, somehow Mosley didn't give up. Now that it wasn't as marketable to be anti-Jew, he just, he took on a new cause, a new enemy, and that was multiculturalism. He chose to become anti-immigration. He also rebranded as being pro-EU, which if we- Whatever was popular at the moment, he was on board to try it. We consider far-right politics now is just surprising. That wouldn't be a stance they would have. But either way, being known as the guy who supported the Nazis during World War yeah, II, he couldn't come back from that. That's that's a lot. Career ending. He got cancelled before cancel culture was even a thing. Oh, I don't think Logan Paul could bounce back from that one. And so he kind of just faded into irrelevancy. Now, coming back from the First World War, after that time in the air and in the trenches and in the loss of all my friends, I was very strongly against another war. Look, I don't know if I'm just a romantic who likes a good story, but I can't help but see like a tragedy story in Mosley's life. It's very easy in retrospect to just look at him as a purely bad fascist dictator wannabe. Fair enough, I get that. But from my research, it really seems that somewhere in the darkness and trauma of what he went through in World War One, he became a man just pained by a deeply utopian and idealistic attitude. He himself and everyone around him made him out like he was the man who was 
going to change the world. But then after being in the system for so long, he became disillusioned and that led him to get radicalized slowly and slowly. When he saw the efficiency of a totalitarian dictator, he realized, well, you know, I could do it the way of democracy or I could do it by force. And he went from being beloved to being completely hated. And there's a part in one interview with him where he's like on death's door. This That's is normally what happened when you end something too long without getting where you want to be. You go from love to hate it. This is him a few years before dying and he still talks as if he might become prime minister. This is an old aged man after all he'd went through. This once feared powerful fascist was now a weak frail man yammering on thinking that he might still become the prime minister you still believe the call might come for you do you oh, really yes, believe I'm that much, i'm much better now than, than i've ever been in my life i still better got at what sir be better at politics that happily history abounds in cases of men who went on to 10 or 15 years older than i am now and did extraordinary things therefore i find that i feel that my let it go. I mean, obviously you did let it go. Well, you, you not until your grave, but like, it was over. Whole life has been a training for what can now come. So in conclusion, I obviously Failed abhor training. most of these politics. But I do think a combination of like tragedy and idealism can lead people down dark paths where what might once have been genuine concern and compassion can be twisted into nihilism and hatred. Unemployment, economic instability, deep inequality, and most importantly, disillusionment with mainstream politics is a fucking rife breeding ground for radicalization and extremism. And this is something we see on both sides to this day happening right now. White people are all racist. White people, the nation, and Russia. Can we give a round of applause for Russia? It is okay to be white. No, that's not, that's not okay. There, there's a lot of things that I love. <laughs> it is okay. About Hitler. Kanye really was going through it. He, he, he really be wilding. Anyway, man, I learned a lot of stuff, man. TLO, leave a like, comment, I'm gone.